you through the math of Medicare. As you know, the program comes in three parts, Medicare A, which covers hospital visits, Medicare B, which covers doctor visits, and Medicare D, the drug benefit that was put into effect just 29 months ago. The infinite horizon present discounted value, the unfunded liability for Medicaid A is $34.4 trillion today. The unfunded liability of Medicaid B is an estimated $34 trillion, and the shortfall for Medicare D has another $17.2 trillion. The total, if you wanted to cover the unfunded liability of all three programs, you'd be stuck today with an $85.6 trillion bill. $85.6 trillion. That's more than six times as large as the bill for Social Security. It's more than six times the annual output of the entire United States economy. Why is the Medicare figure so large? Well, there's a mix of reasons. In part, it's due to the same birth rate and life expectancy issues that affect Social Security. In part, it's due to the ever costlier advances in medical technology and the willingness of Medicare to pay for them. And in part, it's due to the expanded benefits, like the new drug benefit program's unfunded liability, which, as I said earlier, is by itself one-third larger than the entire liability of Social Security. Add the unfunded liabilities from Medicare and Social Security together, and it comes to $99.2 trillion over the infinite horizon. Traditional Medicare comprises 69%, the new drug benefit 17%, and Social Security the remaining 14% of that number. I want to remind you that I'm only talking about the unfunded portions of Social Security and Medicare. It is what the current payment scheme of Social Security payroll taxes and Medicare payroll taxes and membership fees for Medicare B and co-pays and deductibles and all the other revenue currently channeled to our entitled system will not cover under current rules. These existing revenue streams must remain in place in perpetuity to handle the funded entitlement liabilities. If you reduce or eliminate this income and the unfunded liability grows, increased benefits and the liability grows as well. Let me say, or let's just say that you and I and uh, I'll volunteer Bruce Erickson and Gloria Duffy and every citizen in this country who is alive today decides to address the unfunded liability through lump sum payments from our own pocketbooks. We want to get rid of our current liability so that all of us and all future generations can be secure in the knowledge that they will receive the benefits that have been promised to them already. How much would we have to pay to sp split that tab? Well, the math is again painful. With a population of 304 million people in this country, from infants to the elderly, the per person payment to the federal treasury would come to $330,000 per person. This comes to 1.3 million for every family of four, which is 25 times the average household's income. Well, clearly, once and for all, contributions would be an unbearable burden. Alternatively, we could address the entitlement shortfall through policy changes that would affect ourselves and future generations. For example, a permanent 68% increase in federal income tax revenue from individual and corporate taxpayers would suffice to fully fund our entitlement programs. Or we could instead divert 68% of current income tax revenues from their intended uses to the entitlement system, which would accomplish the same thing. Suppose we decided to tackle the issues solely on the spending side. It turns out the total discretionary spending in the federal budget, if maintained at its current share of GDP in perpetuity, is 3% larger than the entitlement shortfall. So all we'd have to do to fully fund our nation's entitlement programs would be to cut discretionary spending by 97%. But hold on. The discretionary spending includes defense, national security, education, the environment, and many other areas, not just those controversial earmarks that make the evening news. All of them would have to be cut. In fact, almost all of them would really have to be eliminated to tackle the problem through discretionary spending. Well, I hope this gives you some idea of just how large the problem is. And just to drive an important point home, these spending cuts or tax increases would need to be made immediately, and they need to be maintained in perpetuity to solve the entitlement deficit problem. Discretionary pending spending would have to be reduced by 97%, not only for our generation, but for our children and their children 
and their children and all children in future generations to come. And similarly, on the taxation side, income tax revenue would have to rise 68% and remain that high forever. Remember, though, I said tax revenue, not tax rates. Who knows how much individual and corporate tax rates would have to change to increase revenue by 68%. If these possible solutions to the unfunded liability problem seem draconian, it's because they are draconian. But they do serve to give you a sense of the severity of the problem. To be sure, there are ways to lessen the reliance on any single policy and burden borne by any particular set of citizens. Most proposals to address long-term entitlement debt, for example, rely on a combination of tax increases, benefit reductions, and eligibility changes to find trillions of dollars necessary to fund and safeguard the system over the long term. No combination of tax heights and spending cuts, though, will change the total burden borne by current and future generations. For the existing unfunded liabilities to be covered in the end, someone must pay $99.2 trillion more or receive $99.2 trillion less than they have currently been promised. That's a cold, solid fact. The decision we must make is whether to shoulder a substantial portion of that burden today or compel future generations of Americans to bear its full weight. Well, now that I've lightened the mood in this room, let me come back to monetary policy and the Fed. It is only natural to cast about for a solution, for any solution, to avoid the fiscal pain we know is necessary before we succumbed to complacency. And, to, and put off dealing with this looming fiscal disaster. Throughout history, many nations, when confronted by sizable debts they were unable or unwilling to pay, have seized upon an apparently painless solution to this problem. It's called monetization. Just have the central bank, the monetary authority, run cash off the printing presses until the debt is repaid, and then promise to be responsible from that point on and hope that your sins will be forgiven by God or Milton Friedman or anybody else. We know, however, from centuries of evidence in countless economies, from ancient Rome to today's Zimbabwe, that running the printing press to pay off today's bills leads to much worse problems later on. The inflation that results from the flood of money in the economy turns out to be far worse than the fiscal pain that those countries hope to avoid. Earlier, I mentioned the Fed's dual mandate to manage growth and inflation. In the long run, growth cannot be sustained if markets are undermined by inflation. Stable prices go hand in hand with achieving economic growth on a sustainable basis. And I have said many, many, many times that inflation is a sinister beast. If you uncage it, it devours savings, it erodes consumers' purchasing power, it decimates the poor. It destroys returns on capital. It undermines the reliability of financial accounting. It distracts the attention of corporate management. It undercuts employment growth and real wages. And it debases the dollar. Purging rampant inflation and a debased currency requires the administration of harsh medicine. We've been there. And we know the cure that was wrought by the Open Market Committee under the leadership of Paul Volcker. Even the perception that the Fed is pursuing a cheap money strategy to accommodate fiscal burdens, should it take root, is a paramount risk to the long-term welfare of the United States.